I like to think that most, if not all, people who've played a fair amount of video games in their lives have at least one title that is wholly special to them. It can be something incredibly popular, it can be something totally obscure. But to these people, it's a game that completely shaped their interests. A game that they can always come back to and play as if it were still the first time. Or if you want to be even more pretentious, a game that no one else gets the way they do. So they end up making a seven hour video on why it sucks. <coughs> All joking aside, I've played a good handful of games over the years that would fit this description perfectly. And the one I probably have the softest spot for is Atlas's last entry in their smash hit medical sim saga Trauma Center, 2010's Trauma Team. I learned about this one thanks to the back cover of my first ever Nintendo Power issue. It's a cool promo image, but it wasn't until reading the review in the next issue and doing some online research that my interest in the game had been piqued. So my dumb teenage ass got himself a copy, played the hell out of it, and fell in love with the thing immediately. God, this is such a great game. Replaying it several times in the years since has only cemented my love for Trauma Team, even though the more times I did, the more its flaws stuck out like a rose's thorn. So, since it is a decade old this year after all, I wanted to take an extensive look into Trauma Team, really dig deep and figure out what makes this game tick, and what the rose-tinted glasses have been blinding me from. This is my first attempt at a long-form analysis-type video, so it'll likely be very rough. But there's just so much going on with this game. Obvious warning, this is gonna be a spoilerific video chuck full of spoilers. So if you've had the slightest interest in it at any point in the past decade, I'd recommend giving it a shot. I'll provide another warning or two when said spoiler stuff will start showing up. Anyway, let's kick this video about Trauma Team off by going out of our way to not discuss Trauma Team for the next while. Instead, let's take a look at the series as a part of and learn about how it got this far before it rode off into the sunset, never to be seen again. Yes, you've been lied to. Trauma Center started out as a bit of a passion project for Atlas's Katsura Hashino around the early 2000s, who up to that point had helped design and direct several Shin Megami Tensei games and also that weird FPS hack and slash Dreamcast game, Machin X. Surgery simulation wasn't exactly a new idea, but any software that could fall under that descriptor was more for the actual professional surgeons in training and not us sweaty gamers. There were some attempts made to gamify this particular concept, the most notable one being a game from the late 80s by the software Toolworks, they made those crappy Mario educational games later on, Life and Death. I want to say it's obscure, but it did get a sequel a few years later, so it must have had some notoriety back then. However, this series was designed by an actual doctor, so it's far more realistic and all about following procedures. Think police quests for practicing medicine. You have your patients, you run your tests on them, you diagnose the disease living inside of them. If it's necessary to, they go in for surgery, and then Yeah, much like Police Quest, it's not above having its weirder or goofier elements, but when it came to actual surgery, it does not fuck around. Ah, mmm, mmm, ooh, ee, mm, ooh, ee, uh, ooh. Also, this promotional image is amazing. The only thing holding back Hashino's pursuit to bring this project to life was the lack of suitable technology on the available game consoles and handhelds at the time. And that wouldn't happen until early 2004 with the announcement of the Nintendo DS. Just look at that touchscreen, it's just begging to have someone pretend they're stitching up a patient on it. With this fancy handheld in tow, Hashino got the ball rolling on development for the project, which lasted about a year and was quite difficult considering most of the staff had only worked on SMT and the like before this. So they had to actually do research and look in books and got talk to people. Ugh, sounds terrifying. Despite the grueling amount of work, they managed to get the project completed and released onto the masses in Japan during the summer of 2005, with the game coming to Western audiences later that fall. That game was called Trauma Center, colon, Under the Knife. Before we go any further, here's a brief overview of how this surgery gameplay works, because it's remained consistent throughout the series, even in Trauma Team. You have a number of tools at your disposal, like a scalpel, forceps, sutures, drain, antibiotic gel, laser, ultrasound, and your syringe. There's some variations and switch-ups here and there, but those are the mainstays. 
and you use those tools to do a whole bunch of things, all while paying attention to the patient's vitals to ensure that they stay alive, and doing this within the given time frame. A major aspect to these older games was a mechanic known as the healing touch. You make a little start pattern on the touch screen and boom, time slows down. This is handy for dealing with the more trickier viruses and bugs the game throws at you, or for when shit hits the fan, which happens more often than it doesn't. Other than that, and the occasional puzzle, this is what each of the games have to offer. Oh, and after you're completing the operation, you're given a score and rank based on various factors. Uh, personally, I never really care for that stuff, but it's there for those who want to challenge themselves further, as if the games themselves weren't already challenging enough. In the making of this video, for kicks and giggles, I decided to play Under the Knife and the games made since to see how well they had aged and to gain some perspective and knowledge as to how the series grew in the trauma team. As you can tell from the title of this video though, I didn't want to make a whole retrospective spanning multiple parts, so we're just going to try to quickfire these four games as we go along, if that's alright with you. And of course, we have to start with Under the Knife. This is the only other game in the series I've played before I started working on this video, picked up in a GameStop a few years after playing Trauma Team, alongside Hotel Dusk and Moon. Guess which one I like the most out of the three? That's not to say Under the Knife is a bad game, in fact, I believe it's an excellent proof of concept. I will commend the team for making great use of the Nintendo DS's features, especially the touchscreen controls, as they are very intuitive. On the other hand, they're also really clunky. More pressing, however, is that the game's difficulty is wildly unbalanced. Those vitals drop way too fast, and combined with the amount of steps it takes to do certain procedures, it gets overwhelming and quite frustrating. It's not impossible, though I do distinctly recall wanting to snap my DS in half at a few points, especially with the ones involving guilt viruses, which are the series' big bad diseases. It's not without its highlights either, I like how it's presented, it certainly stands out from the rest of the series, and I think the characters are fun and the soundtrack is a bop, but this is very much the first iteration of a great concept. And as most first iterations go, it's pretty rough. That said, the game's novelty and style was enough to capture praise from both critics and audiences, with it eventually becoming a decent success for Atlas, and even giving a slight boost in status for the DS, which wasn't doing too hot in its first year. And with success would, of course, come more entries, but most of the team had been sent over to work on the next entry in the Shin Megami Tensei spin-off series, Persona, and those remaining would dedicate themselves to these further entries, thus being dubbed the Kadook Team. Ah, I see what you did there. So what do these fellas do next after making such a smash hit? Immediately remake it for Nintendo's upcoming home console. Alright, yeah, that, that makes sense, carry on. Development for this one started in the earliest days of 2006 and ended right at the Wii's launch in November of that year. Naturally, you'd think it being a remake would have made the process a lot quicker, but nope, they built it all from the ground up and it was a total nightmare because of all the new additions and restraints they had to work with. Nevertheless, the team were still in tip-top shape and the result of all that quick work was Trauma Center Second Opinion, which I consider a decent improvement from Under the Knife. The Wii Pointer controls are much smoother and just as intuitive and Thank our lord and savior Derek Styles, they retooled the difficulties while adding in actual difficulty options. Ugh, oh, it's so nice to look at. Those two aspects make it the better version by default, but it still has its downsides. You can tell this is a Wii launch title because there's no widescreen support, and even if that was due to the aforementioned restraints they were working with, it gets distracting. Worse, they changed up the art style to one that the series would stick with from then on, but this first attempt makes everything look so flat and bland. I much prefer how things originally looked. Some of the other changes made in the game weren't always to its benefits either. That fucking bomb stage is the bane of my existence. But I do like how they incorporated the new Doctor, and there's an additional chapter that just kind of replaces how Under the Knife ended, while extending the story by featuring both Doctors coming together to stop the big bad diseases yet again. Hmm, doesn't that sound familiar? Overall, I would say y'all should play this version over Under the Knife if you had to make a choice, but it was still clear as day that the series had plenty of room to grow. Following its release, Second Opinion saw another positive reception among critics and audiences, and it sold just as well as Under the Knife did. So from here, Kadook Team just had to keep on trucking, and trucking they did, as development for yet another entry started immediately afterwards. Sheesh, you thought Crunch was bad now. Luckily, by now they had a set formula. 
All they had to do was polish it and add improvements or small additions elsewhere. One of those additions was full voice acting, which the series lacked up to this point, and the other was multiplayer, and they really wanted to push the latter as they had not one, but two protagonists to play this time around. Yet again, development took only another year, and it was released in the fall of 2007 as Trauma Center New Blood. I really love these subtitles, by the way. Surely, with all this ambition going around, this would be another rousing success, right? Yeah, here's where things get a bit shaky. If I were to designate any of these games the role of the black sheep, it'd be New Blood. It started out okay, just business as usual, but the further I got into it, the more confused I became. The difficulty and gameplay haven't changed that much, but they feel even more gimmicky than the past two titles. And it doesn't help that the scoring is a lot stricter for some goddamn reason. There's also a larger emphasis on story, too. I mean, there was one before. These games are labeled as visual novels, for some reason. However, they weren't too complicated and served best as a framework for the operations. They are certainly more than welcome to try to bring in a more compelling narrative, as we shall see soon, but they sure as hell didn't do it here. The tone is all over the place, a fair amount of the scenarios are super contrived and really annoying, the slideshow presentation makes sitting through it all quite the dull experience, and the highly touted voice acting is complete weak sauce. Too bad we can't leave though. We finally managed to dodge the late shift, and we're stuck here anyway. Well, this bed has my name on it, so I'm gonna get some much needed sleep. It's such a shame it turned out this way, because there's a lot of really, really good ideas, but they're just executed so poorly. And I got so sick of it towards the end, I put it down and haven't picked it up since. I wouldn't necessarily call it a bad game, but man, was this a disappointment. Oh, and as for the multiplayer, they just split up the surgical tools between two players and like have at it. It's okay. I'm not alone in thinking New Blood wasn't that great either, as reviews weren't as praiseworthy towards it as they had been with the other two. Sales were just about the same, yet they were also a little lower than the past two games as well. Despite the slight setback, the series would return in full form not too long after, as another entry was already in development, this one being a direct sequel to Under the Knife, and apparently it only happened due to fan demand. However, since Kadook team had their hands full with New Blood, and the Next game after that, another team stepped in to co-develop this entry, Vanguard, a company I could find very little info on other than how they helped develop RPG titles like Lunar Eternal Blue and Grandia during the mid-90s. Oh, and the second Chominiki game as well. You can't forget that. So with Vanguard's help, Atlas was able to deliver to fans what they wanted, and the game was subsequently named Trauma Center Under the Knife 2. And... I'm not sure if this was due to low expectations, having played New Blood right before it, but I really like this game. Once again, there's a heavier emphasis on story, but it's far more engaging than anything the series had done by then. There are characters with interesting motivations and backstories that made me care for them. There's a lot of good writing and some very intense sequences and twists. And sure, it delves into goofy territory at points, but it actually builds up to that stuff incredibly well and makes for easily the best narrative of those four games. All that said, there aren't really any new tricks to the gameplay, and I noticed a lot of repeating scenarios from past games, but if we're comparing it directly to the first Under the Knife, it plays so much better and is so much fairer. You can feel the polish they buffed these mechanics with. Honestly, if this is where the series had stopped, it would have left on a high note, and it would easily have been my favorite of the bunch. Unfortunately, critics and audiences were starting to feel burnout from the series, which now had four games with practically the same gameplay that were released during the past three years. So it was in trouble, not helped by how other games like Persona 4 and Entry and Odyssey were gaining far more momentum for Atlas's profile. This next entry was essentially Go Big or Go Home, and luckily, Kadook team were prepared to do just that. Having started development for it right after New Blood came out, they knew it was time to take the series in a new direction. And they did so by including a whopping six characters in six areas of medical practice. How's that for ambition? This wasn't just for show though, they wanted to make a very complicated narrative that would seamlessly weave the lives and stories of these characters, while taking heavy inspiration from certain real-life events, in order to provide a more grounded and realistic structure. It was an arduous development cycle that once again involved an insane amount of research thanks to these new additions, and an insane amount of refinement in its new mechanics, and likely an insane amount of compression because there were over 15,000 dialogue lines included and over 100 music tracks. 
And yet, they got it done. It took a lot longer to do so, but Kadook team believed that it would be worth it. And if this was to be the last century in the series, they were going to go out with a bang. So, let's finally see how that turned out. As explained, we have six different doctors specializing in six different professions. Any of these six doctors are available right from the start of the game. We are free to play their stages and experience their stories however we please in whatever order we'd like to. It's certainly a nice change of pace from the linear progression of past games, because they could have easily just strung it all together in a set order, and there technically is one, yet they left it completely up to the player regardless. It serves as a great example on just how much we have to unpack here, but for the sake of simplicity and neatness, we'll be discussing each gameplay and individual narrative in the order of the profession the game's laid out for us. So, in the spirit of changing things up and bringing the franchise into a bold new direction, let's start with surgery. Earlier I explained how the surgery gameplay generally works over the course of the whole series, and on the surface, Trauma Team's take on it isn't that different from what we've seen so far. Once again, you're given a series of patients with all kinds of problems, some mild, others not so mild, and you have various tools at the ready to get them all healed up. While you're doing that, you still need to pay attention to the patient's vitals, because if they drop to zero, you're done, son. And upon completion, you're still graded on how well you surgery based on the number of cools, goods, and bads you got, whatever unexplained special bonuses you've obtained along the way, and how much time it took for you to do the job. Thank you for saving that patient, Doctor, but since you took more than three minutes to do so, I have no choice but to take away your PhD. Now go fuck off back to Weenie Hut General, you dunce. Oddly enough though, this time around, it appears the team wanted to simplify this gameplay to its core aspects and see what new scenarios they could make with these restrictions in place. They tried to achieve this by removing two prominent aspects of this surgery gameplay. First, they got rid of the timer completely during operation, so you no longer risk losing due to merely running out of time. Yeah, it still keeps track of time, but now it's just for scoring purposes. So you can just keep the poor bastard on the operating table in purgatory and the game won't care. Whenever the timer does come back though, it's used quite effectively and provides a natural sense of urgency to the situation. The other big change made to the classic setup is the removal of the healing touch. No longer can we stop our patient's vitals, or slow down time, or stop time altogether in order to get out of a pinch. And frankly, good riddance. I thought it was gimmicky in concept and gimmicky in execution, and it would have been very out of place had they kept it considering the more grounded approach the writers want to take with the story here. Now excuse me, while I suck out these amorphous shapes the game calls blood pools and excise these rubies, I mean tumors, out of the patient's gut. As you can tell, there are also some changes made to the visuals during these stages. They're a lot more stylized, and the saturation's been turned all the way up. It's a far cry from the grittiness of past games art styles, and once again, I think it's a great change. I did like the grimier look of past games, to an extent. Like, I didn't care for New Blood, but damn did it look harsh. But I appreciate the effort gone into this more flared up art style, it provides a nice contrast to the horrific elements we'll be facing throughout the game. As for how it all plays out, while well, the gameplay here is pretty much the same thing it's always been, just with a more softened edge, it still works very well. In fact, it's probably the most polished surgery gameplay that the series has ever had. Tool selection is quick and efficient, the pointer controls are smooth and just as intuitive as they've always been, the interface is nicely organized, and even the defibrillator is less irritating to use. I would still prefer the controls for moving around the operation space to be completely separate rather than assigned to a specific tool, but it's not that big a deal. It is certainly fun, fast-paced, and exhilarating, but even with the curveballs they throw in and only having six, uh, five and a half stages to go through, personally it just wasn't as fun as some of the other professions they added in. Probably didn't help that I went through an endless number of similar operations by marathoning the series for this video, but I've always felt this way about how surgery plays in this game. It's pretty good, just not my favorite. Yet we're not quite done with this section of the game, as we still need to discuss the surgeon you're playing as and what their story is. From the outset, one can assume that he's not exactly an equivalent to the big goofball known as Derek Styles, or the new Blood Doctor for that matter, and that assumption would be correct, because he's certainly distinct among those other protagonists, for better or worse. The gloomy looking Moe fellow in question goes by the name of CR SO1, but that ain't easy to blurt out during dramatic moments, so everyone just calls him Doctor. His actual name is never mentioned at any point during the game. He does have one, though you can only find that out by reading the official Trauma Team Famitsu book. 
where they call him Erhard Muller. Erhard, huh? Yeah, that's a bit too clunky for me, so I'm just gonna call him Jim. Jim here is a master surgeon, unlike any other, who's been brought to the game's main location, Resurgum, to assist in various operations and perform the more difficult ones. But he's not doing this out of the goodness of his own heart. Years prior, he was accused, tried, and convicted of orchestrating a bioterrorism attack that would be referred to as the Cumberland College Incident. One that resulted in a mass casualty of lives and brought on some good old fashioned amnesia for our perpetrator. Unable to recall nor deny taking part in the act, he was slapped with a life sentence of 250 years. So his temp work at Resurgum is essentially the government giving the bastard an opportunity to atone for his sins. And the more successful operations he performs there, the more years that'll be taken off his sentence. Tagging along for the ride is an FBI agent by the name of Holden, who at first seems to just be along for the ride, but of course he has a bit of his own baggage. His wife and daughter were among the victims of the Cumberland incident, and so for him, keeping an eye on this dude is personal. So yeah, at first, Jim may be very sulky and quite the dull character, but he has good reason to be this way. Despite excelling in his field, his actions have brought him the disdain of many, sometimes to the point where they don't even view him as human. I mean, just look at how he's introduced with his half-assed Iron Giant cosplay. He doesn't appear to trust anyone because of all this, most of all himself, as he downplays his expertise no matter how well he performs in operations. Not even an S rank phases him. Certain factors, like the presence of Holden and a certain chewing out by a particular member of Resurgum, all but reinforce that mentality. And this, along with still being confined whenever he's not doing surgery, continuously reminds him of what he's been accused of. Something he doesn't even remember doing in the first place. He was there though, so he must have done did the crime. Right? Jim's time at Resurgum serves as both a way to try to make amends for his crimes, and come to terms with how he most likely isn't responsible for said crimes. His associates certainly think so, even the one that confronted him about that shit, but his doubts about his own abilities and his past continue to linger and expand. All until the very person who caught him tells him to buck up. Yes, the man who lost his family in the incident doesn't believe this convicted murderer did the dirty deed either. And regardless of whatever happened, the past is in the past, and wallowing in misery over it doesn't help anyone. I mean, they're not gonna let him free though, that'd be too charitable. So with this motivation, he's finally found the resolve to save the lives of his patients no matter what the consequences may be. It's a rather simple arc, which makes sense because Jim is a rather simple character. It feels kind of uneventful too, seeing as he's pretty much either at the operating table or in a cell of some sort, but his change over the course of his numerous surgeries and interactions with his peers is reasonably compelling. The mystery of the Columbine incident does provide some relative intrigue to the story, but it merely serves as a backdrop to Jim's character development. Also, it's quite obvious from the outset that there's no way this dude is a guilty party. Why put him in this situation in the first place otherwise? Or hell, make him the protagonist? Not saying it isn't possible, but compared to some of the other criminals we'll be seeing across the game, he's far too remorseful and dour over the situation. Here's a fun anecdote though. See, I was kidding when I called him a Moe Blob, but originally the lead doctor was envisioned as a homosexual masculine type with some sort of effeminate personality, until Atlas USA tapped the writers on the shoulder to tell them what a bad idea that would be. Seeing as how Atlas's games have treated LGBTQ plus characters before and since then, it was more than likely the right move to go for the emo look. As for the person doing Jim's performance, well, the credits don't exactly label who that is, since this was made at a point in time where voice actors went uncredited in these games more often than not. So let's fix that. We have the Mr. Nolan North doing this job, and outside of a few underwhelming lines and sounding stuffier than usual, It's a lie. The courtyard is less than 90 seconds away. Even if he'd run from there, he wouldn't be breathing this hard. He does as good as he always does. As for how Jim stands up next to Mr. Derek Styles, well, we've had three, uh, two and a quarter games to flesh out his character, so Jim is lacking by default. But he's distinctive enough in terms of his development to make him at least stand out, even if I think he's not quite as interesting as some of the other doctors in this game. Whatever, he's better than a new blood guy. Whoever that was, I don't remember his name. You remember his name? No, you don't. Point made. Moving on. Here we have the first completely different medical gameplay style this series has ever had. And at first glance, it really doesn't look that different from surgery, does it? The interface is similar, and while you don't appear to have as many tools at your disposal, it seems like you're still performing operations of some sort, so... what gives? 
Well, appearances are deceiving, because while first response does appear to play out in a similar manner to surgery, it takes that pace and then injects it with three doses of adrenaline. You're thrown into a variety of crisis situations resulting from some kind of accident or other event, and there's a bunch of hideously maimed individuals that you have to administer first aid on before they get sent to the hospital, and also without them dying on you. Fortunately, you have more than enough gauze, bandages, tape, scissors, pens, IVs, and fists to tend to these people as quickly and efficiently as possible. Oh, and of course the magic healing juice. Can't forget that, every first responder has those, just ask one. However, don't be misled into thinking that stabilizing them will be easy, because these fellows are ten times as fragile as the poor suckers who go under the knife. Worse, you can only focus on one of them at a time, and there are usually more than one victim in these situations, so it becomes one big juggling act, and if you're not careful, things will go downhill quickly. Okay, this lady has some burns and glass shards embedded into her skin, nothing I can't handle. Uh, oh, they found another victim. Uh, well, I'll get to them later. Uh, shoot, the lady's trying to say something. Oh, uh, okay, um, I, oh, vitals are a bit low, uh, yeah. oh, all right, let's just check this dude out. Oh, fuck, oh, god, I, I, I gotta, I gotta clean up all this blood. Oh, damn it, oh, I'll get to you in a second, man, just hold on. All right, Cutter, do your thing. Okay, man, I'm just gonna heal you for now, you gotta finish up with this lady. Oh, god, fucking hell, oh, okay, book it. Oh, you fuck, 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 fuck. Okay, back to this dude. Sorry, man. I'm, I'm trying to do my best here. Uh, I'm gonna clean up the blood again. Okay, back to the leg. Bye-bye, tacky slacks. Oh, heavenly lord, that ain't pretty. Gotta get the fucking tourniquet. Oh, sh fucking shit! Fucking shit! Oh, I can't fucking do this! <sighs> okay, you see what I mean, right? And exactly for the faint of heart. Didn't make writing notes down for this stuff any easier, either. While going through these stages can make for a nerve-wracking experience, I gotta say, I really like them. As a younger boy, the constant stress deterred me from replaying these parts of the game like I would in other areas, but over the years, I've come to appreciate these stages so much more and it's one of my favorite modes. The way it strips back the established trauma center surgery gameplay even further than the surgery in here does, and emphasizes multitasking a lot harder, makes for a much more exciting time than surgery. But if it sounds just a bit too much for you all, the developers were nice enough to implement some buffers in order to try to alleviate some of the direness of these events, the most notable of which is the patient limit. You remember how in surgery, if the patient's vitals fall to zero, it's game over? Here, you can allow some of these victims to meet a similar fate without failing altogether. True, I guess in this kind of field you can't exactly save everyone, but for me at least, this mechanic had the opposite effect, because not once did I ever accept losing a life in general. And frankly, if that ever did happen, things would just continue to get worse, so it would warrant a restart. It's a good thing these events don't take up too much time, so that restarting isn't a complete loss, which is more than I can say for some games. Any problems I had with this mode were really down to me, because while it does feel like it's far easier to make mistakes here than any other mode, and that would appear to be due to the margin of error being a lot smaller than it is in surgery, it's more likely that my hands were shaking so goddamn much that misses occurred more frequently. Regardless of my own shortcomings as a stupid-ass human being, this mode is a lot of fun and provides a great alternative to those looking for an even simpler approach to the core mechanics of this series' gameplay even if it's a deceptively simple one. Honestly, I think the biggest issue I had pertaining to first response would have to be the character attached to it. That character is the one and only Maria Torres. She's the polar opposite of Gloomy McLoomy in practically every way, because she is the coolest and bestest paramedic out there. She is so good, anyone else trying to help her are just a complete nuisance and will only get in her way. But if they're lucky, they'll have the privilege to take orders from her and only her. She is that determined to do everything by herself and is 100% confident in believing she can. And if anyone tries something funny, well, it's lights out for them. So yeah, I, I guess she's a little arrogant if you look at her close enough. Now while this does give off a certain air of annoyance and shallowness, you can't claim that she doesn't have the skills to back up her personality. I mean, she jumpstarts a flatliner's heart with one good fist to the chest. Usually it takes about 10 of those for that to work. Or was it 15? Or, or, or 20? Uh, d don't trust me to perform CPR, is what I'm saying. Her origins shed some light on how she grew into this mold, too. 
She was an orphan growing up, and a troublesome one at that, as she accidentally set fire to her orphanage while smoking in the bathroom. However, in the midst of the chaos, she managed to save one of her orphan mates. And what started as a stupid accident actually sparked her passion for saving lives, and her life goal from henceforth was to become a hero people can look up to. So that's why she's always on her own, that's why she's always so fiery and hesitant about working with others, and that's also why her arc involves that mentality being torn to shreds. After a few segments showing off her excellent paramedical skills and clashes against other paramedics, Hey, I got the hydraulic cutter! We can cut the metal out with this! Goddamn idiot! Don't touch it! Like removing the foreign object should be our priority in this case. Oh yeah, this is totally a textbook procedure. Shut the hell up! Just get out of my way and be quiet unless I say otherwise. What? Ugh, fine, whatever. Goddamn amateur. Wasting my time. She's warned by one of her associates that there's only so much one person can do by themselves. Obviously, she takes heed in that advice and grows the fuck up. Oh, wait, no she doesn't, she just blows it off as total nonsense. And then right after that, a boat explodes. So she goes out and does her thing, and alienates everyone in the process, which is why she had to resort to a box cutter. Despite that, things seem to be proceeding as well as usual, until... We've got another one! I'll be real, when this first happened, I thought I would actually have to save these people. Thank god we were supposed to let them die. <laughs> eh. uh, again, don't trust me to do CPR around you. If you start choking, you're pretty much a dead man. Having reached the point where the crisis is completely out of her control, and now she has to... rely on people, she breaks down. Now, for the longest time, I thought this was due to how she couldn't save everyone in this scenario. During this recent playthrough, however, I started thinking it was actually because she had to get help and that's the biggest possible blow to her pride. Then while I was writing this long ass script, I came to the realization that it was both scenarios. And then while I was recording the dialogue, I remembered that- I'm just joshing around, but I may as well put it out there that Maria's story is the least good of the six individual ones available, IMO. There's nothing really wrong with the story itself, it's a solid framework that even at its barest works quite well. It's just, what isn't interesting by themselves is Maria. She's a two-dimensional hothead that doesn't change a whole lot through her story, and it gets boring after a while. Apparently, the writers had a hell of a time figuring out who she was gonna be, and it shows. I think she works far better as a secondary character in other people's stories, as she provides a good counterbalance to pretty much all of them since they're a lot less energetic than she is. I don't know, I don't dislike her, but she's just a bit lukewarm as far as her story goes. Weirdly enough, the biggest comparison people draw towards her is that of Chi from Persona 4. And, well, it's not really hard to see why. I've yet to play it as of writing, and recording, and editing, and uploading. But they do appear to be quite similar in terms of being the spunky one. Though I'm not sure if Chi is as quick to get up in people's faces as Maria is. If this rowdy lass does have one thing over the other characters, it's that she has a ghost friend. No, really, she does. This apparition pops up occasionally at the most convenient times, first as some creepy shadow figure, then as some petite forlorn girl. Thing is, she doesn't do a whole lot besides making Maria space out for a few seconds and getting her angry by saying beginning a lot. She does serve as a bit of a focal point for Maria's last big trial, where, while shopping around at a mall with her co-workers, she shows up yet again to tell her to... And then this happens. With that, she gets stuck in another big heap of shit, as I did, because holy god, this last segment was brutal. Like, the first victim here is already on the verge of death, and I can't transport any of the stabilized ones. Despite these dire circumstances, Maria finally realizes that it's okay to swallow one's pride and ask for help from others. And thanks to the power of god in anime, help arrives in the nick of time. See? People will be there for you no matter what. As long as you're not a dick about it. 
While I wasn't particularly impressed with Maria's individual arc, I can still point out a few more positives about her. She has a bit more going on with her than Jim does, at least. And I also think she's one of the funniest characters. The best aspect, though, has to be the person performing her, Amanda Wynn Lee. She does a fantastic job. Her delivery is so pointed and full of energy, it's great. Shut the hell up! Oh, and even with all my complaints, I'll easily take Maria over the new blood chick. Yeah, I forgot her name too, and I don't care. That's how much contempt I have for that garbage. I'm kidding, it's not really that bad. Up next on our little medical gameplay train is orthopedics. I remember those broken bones from the previous segment? Well, this field is all about them, among other things. Now, this isn't exactly new to the Trauma Center series. There have been plenty of one-off stages involving some kind of bone reconstruction, but Trauma Team takes a much more complicated angle to healing up those bones, as well as introducing a few more sensitive conditions that can't be treated with normal surgery. As such, the developers decide to slow things down here, give it a more methodical and relaxed flow. Because these parts of the body are delicate and require extreme focus and precision to handle properly. You don't want to dig into that spine only to accidentally snip some of the little stringy lines inside of it. Considering this, most of the broken bones one will encounter through here ain't going to be fixed by gluing them back together with the magic gel. And fret not surgery lovers, there are still plenty of tumors involved. Because it ain't a trauma center game without an abundance of tumors. However, this more meticulous approach brings some changes in the structure, as things are a lot more restrictive in terms of progression. So what orthopedics actually ends up being is a linear series of tasks with no room for improvisation or multitasking. You're given your medical instrument, you do what you need to do with that instrument, and then move on to the next step of the procedure either with that same instrument or a new one that the game will also give to you. Scoring now relies on this chain system where your score gets higher and higher the better you perform during the operation. Also, like before, there's no timer involved, but unlike before, vitals don't come into play during these segments. Instead, you have this mistake limit, and if you make 10 of those mistakes through any means possible, you're fired. This mechanic has been used in the past with this series, specifically under the knife, and all it did there was just add more unnecessary pressure and frustration to those game's operations. Here, it fits perfectly and complements the precise nature of the gameplay quite well. So I will commend these stages for being solidly built and well implemented, while also involving the heaviest amount of motion controls out of any other gameplay style. It gets a little finicky, but it's good enough for the kind of accuracy that these portions are asking for. Also, like with the other two modes, there are plenty of mix-ups in the general flow of gameplay to keep things interesting. For as well-made as orthopedics is, unfortunately, the slower pace makes the inherent repetition of these procedures even more apparent, and that alone makes these stages drag very hard. I can't really argue that all these stages took longer than surgery or first response, but at least those had you doing 50,000 things at once so time could fly by without a problem. As a result, the difficulty plummets to a point the series has never seen before. I've only made like one or two mistakes at any given stage, and most of the time, I don't make mistakes at all. There's at least enough variety here to not make it completely boring, but the more times I play them, the less exciting they become. On the bright side, the Doctor you play as doesn't come anywhere close to being boring. This dapper looking fellow goes by the name of Mr. Hank Freebird. He's just as skilled in his profession as all the other doctors are, but he also has a hidden side to him. Whenever he's not saving lives as an orthopedist, he's saving lives under the guise of Captain Eagle, the ambassador of love and justice. That's how he gets introduced, by the way. And a tiny part of me wanted to see him do his orthopedic stuff as his alter ego. But nah, this is just a side gig that no one else knows about. Somehow. And it's not like his normal get-up for surgery is any more ridiculous as is. So here we have yet another character who went into the medical field wanting to save lives and be a hero of sorts. Though I guess he wasn't satisfied with that alone, so now he dons a cheap latex suit and prances around the city picking fights. For as goofy as that sounds, and is, he's still a much more entertaining character than our last hero type person. For one, his origins are a bit darker than accidental arson. It's only in one scene, but from that we learn that he was an army man well before all of this. And I assume at some point his comrade fell in battle and he's been distressed ever since for not being able to save him. Well, at least that explains why he has the physical attributes to do this hero job in the first place. 
However, as we learn in between the operations, his acts of heroism aren't necessarily received well by the general public. And in time, that catches up to him despite his best efforts. It's a little contrived. Okay, not just a little. But it still makes him question why he's even doing this in the first place. Does he really want to save lives? Or is he just doing it to feel better about himself? His resolve is further tested by one of his own patients, a young lady named Claire. She arrived at Resurgum thanks to a suicide attempt, and despite being saved by our hero, she's not exactly happy with the fact that she's still alive. Now this just bewilders the hell out of Mr. Freebird. According to him, life is wonderful, so why would anyone in the world want to kill themselves? What do you gain from being dead? <laughs> ah, I like this guy. It's actually a decent hypothetical, but well, it's not exactly the deepest examination of suicide or depression. At least it's better than how they went about that in Under the Knife or Second Opinion, in which your nurse partner tells a horrifically sick patient to fucking kill themselves. And this was after she scolded us for not being caring enough and comforting our patients. Yes, that does happen. I forget everything else, this was the most bizarre thing to happen in the entire series. Uh, mm, scratch that second most. Nevertheless, this initial ungratefulness sticks with Hank, and combined with the hostile attitude the public gave towards Captain Eagle, his grapple with whether it's right or wrong to play superhero ends with him trashing his getup and moving past that foolish notion. After that, he continues doing his real job, and apparently embraces the Florence Nightingale syndrome because he befriends Claire in the meantime. So despite his hang-ups about hanging up the cape, he seems to be doing well for himself. But, of course, this is Trauma Team. And it wouldn't be Trauma Team without... <gasps> yep. Oh, and guess who got caught in the crossfire? Yep! With one love interest down, Mr. Freebird goes fucking ballistic and confronts the gunman face to face, asking him the burning question of, the fuck bruh? Well, it turns out this bruh has his own personal issues and frustrations about society, so he resorted to the Joker method of slugging anyone who looks at him funny or questions his methods, which Hank didn't seem to get the memo on, so... Nah, I'm kidding. This is Hank Freebird, bitch. Two measly bullets ain't enough to bring this beast down. This, in turn, scares the gunman off the balcony, and the obvious happens, but instead of rightfully beating the shit out of him while he's down for capping his boo and plugging a few rounds into his rock-hard abs, our hero just scoops him up ready to take him to the hospital. Of course, this draws the ire of the crowd, but it provokes Hank into delivering a soliloquy about whether it do be right for these villains to die, though. So despite having two bits of lead in his body and against the will of literally everyone else, Hank brings the fucker to Resurgum and operates on him successfully. Or unsuccessfully, if you want a good laugh. I sure did. <laughs> Fuck this guy. Keep in mind that this was all because of his strong-headed belief that life is wonderful. Yeah, I'm sure the guy will appreciate that while he's serving out his life sentence, my dude. Oh, yeah, and Claire survived the shooting. So any dramatic tension derived from that went up in a puff of smoke. Out of all the possible criticisms I could have for this story, that total cop-out moment at the end is the one that chafes me the most. I suppose it makes sense for Hank's theme and character progression, cause yeah, yeah, life is wonderful and all that crap. But they still could have brought that across if she had died too. Morbidly so, yet it would have been far more compelling than what ended up happening. It's weird because, well, it's not like it's implied she didn't die in the first place, and it's also not like the game is afraid of death. Regardless of my reservations there, it still works out because the general tone is so earnest and optimistic, just like the main character. It's stupid and ridiculous and silly and dumb, yet I can't help but love this stuff and this fucking goofball doctor. And originally I was down on it because of that and how it ended, but it grew on me significantly over time, and trust me when I say Hank gets even better outside his main story. Unfortunately, as much as I would love to believe the wiki wholeheartedly, he's not voiced by John Redcorn. Instead, it's Dave B. Mitchell, who is perfectly fine in the role. <sighs> this is what you get when your VOs go uncredited, you have to rely on shitheads to guess who the cast is. Similar to orthopedics, endoscopy is a more intricate approach to the standard surgery formula. 
But instead of specializing in bones, it specializes in sticking a camera down the patient's gullet and encountering a wealth of diseases and complications that are much harder to reach than with normal surgery. It's like we're in a little tank going around and cleaning up this sick, sick body. Very Osmosis Jones-ish. Except without... That. Considering the device is a literal camera, it shouldn't be any surprise that these stages are viewed from a first-person perspective. Technically, they all are, but this is the only one where you have some sort of direct movement, or I guess need to move in order to progress. And while it appears to be just as plotting as orthopedics, the flow is actually very similar to that of surgery. You're still on a set path, yet you can deal with these ailments in whatever order you want to as they appear, leaving just enough room for some strategic thinking. This also means vitals come back into play, and the timer appears a bit more often too, but once again, when it is used, it's very effective in creating actual tension. There's also the challenge of navigating through the stage in general. You're faced with long stretches of intestines or lungs, and hitting the walls of these areas will result in a big boo-boo and a big loss to the vitals. Sometimes they just turn into flat-out mazes with dead ends and gates, and using the radar in the upper right-hand corner is a necessity to get shit done in time. So yeah, there are elements of normal surgery stuff in here, but it's more complex and elaborate like how endoscopies normally are. And I certainly like the idea. In practice, though, it's a clunk fest. This is not an uncommon criticism with this mode, but the control scheme implemented here to do all this endoscopic stuff is not an ideal one. The Wii mode is used as both the camera's light and method of moving it forward and backward. However, you still need to move the cursor in order to accurately steer the camera around walls or bring it to that ruby-ass looking tumor to fuck up its good time. And that's done with the control stick on the nunchuck. This is what it looks like, and yes, it gets exhausting fast. The nunchuck is also used for selecting tools and for using them. You tap C to open the tool menu, attach it to the control stick, press C again to close the menu, and then Z to perform its action. It works fine when you have one, maybe two areas to destroy, but when you have a bunch, it's a mess. I understand they had to get the control scheme to fit with the first person view, but this couldn't have been the best way to do so. This could also be why the stabilizer outputs more magic juice per dose than in first response or in surgery. In the end, all this does is make endoscopy a lot more tiring and annoying than it should be. And that's a shame. Again, I like how it differs from regular surgery, and I think the slow nature of it works far better here than in orthopedics. I should stress it's not bad, but I wasn't exactly enthralled whenever I had to do it. It does have one saving grace, though. The endoscopic professional you play as is one kick-ass gal. Her name is Tomoe Tachibana, and once again you'll immediately notice that she has a wildly different feel than the other characters. Her presence exudes a strong sense of honor, gracefulness, and tranquility. And boy, is she awesome. She's a high-ranking member of the Tachibana clan, and is set to succeed in the role of its leader, being the chief's daughter and all. However, relations between her and her father seem to be quite strained, as she's come to America in order to find her own path in defiance of her determined destiny. And while she's rather soft-spoken, she's very firm in her beliefs. She's also fucking loaded and a ninja, and will kill you if you're not careful. She doesn't even try to be that way either, that's just how she is. And for that, she is wonderful. I just wish her own story wasn't lacking by comparison. Starting to notice a common theme here? For as skilled as Tomoe is, she's never quite left behind the Tachibana clan. Her butler, Hanzo, is practically attached to her. She lives in a goddamn mansion that's clearly modeled after her former home. And also there are ninja warriors that haunt her every night telling her to come home so daddy can find her a nice boy. It's almost anachronistic in a way, because this sounds more and more like a Yakuza clan rather than something found in the Meiji period. Or maybe that's just because I've been playing Yakuza 0 recently. It's a pretty good game, you should try it out. Anyway, it's definitely weird, but it establishes her struggle for individuality well enough. Yet despite wanting to separate herself from her origins and trying to stay on her own path of honor, this stuff serves as a constant reminder of her lineage, and it's not like she can just throw it all away. I mean, she could, that would definitely put her on her own path, but that path would more than likely leave her in a ditch off the side of a dirt road. This culminates when the ninja warriors inform her that the elders of the clan will be gathering to determine her family's future. She's a bit hesitant in joining the meeting, but comes to the conclusion that she has no choice because her blood is so strongly tied to this clan. Then again, I doubt putting this off longer would cause it to collapse overnight. And you know, it's not like the dad's impotent. He and the mother can probably still get another Tachibana going. Uh, oh, wait, the mother's dead. 
Okay, never mind, she's screwed. So she goes back home in a private helicopter with her favorite old butler and prepares to enter a new, dreadfully boring chapter of marriage and childbearing as decreed by her scary looking daddo. Until her co-workers burst onto the scene and cause a ruckus because they want their doctor lady back, goddammit! Isn't that a nice sentiment? The reunion doesn't last long though, as Daddy Pooh passes out due to a collapsed lung. Sadly, they don't have any box cutters lying around, but Tomoe brought her handy dandy endoscopy machine along for the ride, so they're able to treat his grievous injury just in time. This, in turn, gives her the confidence to continue pursuing her own path back in America, which her father more or less approves of, because she kind of left him while he was still conked out, but hey, that's the daughter of a powerful ninja clan for ya. That ain't the end of her story, though, because she still longs for that sense of individuality, since her friends were the ones who had to save her from the evils of systemic oppression. So what better way to test that resolve than with a terrible, terrible accident? Yeah, in case you forgot, she was there, too. And she had gone off with Hang to do her own thing. That thing was helping the people trapped underneath the rubble that fell towards the floor below. Oh, yeah, and that one guy, too. He, uh, he took a bit of a tumble. They don't have a lot of time to do so, since the ruins are very precarious and could collapse at any moment, sealing these victims' fate. Oh, and there's also a multi-ton Wayne school bus right above them that'll fall at any second, since it's only propped up on a column, but hey, it could be worse. It's a fight against time and gravity, and there's only one way this rescue can be completed successfully. Allow me to break off into gameplay once again, j just for a quick second. As this is one of the only times in the game where the established gameplay structure and mechanics are used in a completely different context with little to no relevance towards surgery or medical practice or anything like that. And I hate to say it, but it's also my favorite endoscopy stage. The controls aren't much better than they were before, and if you want to boil it down, it's just another glorified maze. But now the process has been whittled down to the point where you're just moving the camera to find these victims, usually through auditory clues and noises. Once again, for the longest time, I was never really that into it, but the more times I play this stage, the more I realize how ingenious it is. It has a layer of tension and suspense that none of the other stages have, and I love how it's just a simple matter of navigation, which was already a large part of the stages up to that point. God, it just all works so, so well. I kind of wish they did this more often, but in turn, making it so infrequent only adds to its quality. After everyone's been found, that mangled mess of doom from above still lingers and still threatens their lives, but Tomoe offers reassurance to the victims that everything will be fine and she'll stay by their side until they're rescued. Obviously, that doesn't stop the hunk of junk from crashing down below, and then everyone dies. The end. Okay, here's what really happened, but it's no less silly. You ain't going nowhere. You see what I was talking about with Maria, right? You didn't see this shit in her story. You didn't see this shit in her story. Once that last smidge of terror is resolved, Tomoe finally gets her own reassurance that if it weren't for her actions, these people wouldn't have been alive. And at last, she is free from the bounds of her former fate and can now live a peaceful, happy life. Damn, look at this dude. He got fucked up. Probably not an important character though, so whatever. Overall, Tomoe's arc isn't particularly original or enthralling. It's kind of all over the place too, and for as much as I like her, she's definitely bordering on stereotypical. But she's such a modest and humble force to be reckoned with that I'm more than willing to forgive the relative lacklusterness of her story. And I'm not just saying it because of that one promo pic of her in the nurse outfit. Her voiceover, Stephanie Sha, also did a swell job conveying her graceful nature. And, um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Just a fun, fun character. Oh, yeah, and she's also another one people compare a certain Persona 4 cast member to. Uh, Yukiko? Again, I haven't seen much of P4, so let's go with the reserved sure for that one. So now we've reached the point where Kaduk team started experimenting even further outside the mere surgery style gameplay they've honed their craft on for years. The diagnosis segment put you in the role of a humble diagnostician, and your goal is to diagnose patients who've been assigned to you with whatever the hell is going on in their mortal bodies. This is the biggest shift in gameplay that Trauma Team has offered thus far, 
Honestly, the biggest shift of the entire series. We're making a full genre pivot here, going from fast-paced surgery simulation style action to a straight-up point-and-click adventure game. In order to accurately diagnose these people, you have a number of ways to find symptoms and abnormality, ranging from a simple visual exam and conversing about how and what they're currently feeling, to bringing out the stethoscope, performing a blood test, or running an EKG, and if necessary, getting them on one of them big machines that takes a picture of your bones or beams you with gamma rays. After you've discovered a sufficient amount of symptoms, you can then use your handy dandy robot assistant to narrow down the list of possible candidates for the illness. Now if these terms you've been seeing aren't that familiar to you, don't worry, they weren't to me either. And trust me when I say it's all smoke and mirrors. Locating these symptoms boils down to whether or not something is out of place, and a lot of them are quite easy to spot. Even when it comes to the more complicated tests, you're basically playing spot the difference, and said differences are usually quite obvious. That said, it is possible to mess up. And if you do so five times, then it's game over for our fair doctor. Thankfully, you can save it practically any time, so not really much to worry about in terms of difficulty. It's very Phoenix Wright-ish in a way, like if he went to medical school during that seven-year hiatus he went through after... Uh, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. In fact, it's so similar that the inherent flaws in this approach carry over as well. Those being how it's quite a linear experience, so after you've gone through these segments once, you've pretty much seen all there is. And more frustratingly, progression depends on gathering a set amount of symptoms available at the moment. If you missed one, and you're not sure what it is or where it can be found, well, good luck, Sabin! It can also feel long-winded for those who don't have a lot of interest in the study of diseases, and because most stages are separated into multiple parts involving multiple diagnoses, oh, and because there's also a lot more text. Personally, none of these potential issues were deal-breakers for me. I love this mode. I won't deny I'm a bit biased, though. I've always had a fascination with diseases and the causes behind those diseases. Like, one of my favorite shows growing up was like a disease or injury of the week style thing that I found very enthralling. What the fuck is this? No, no, not that fucking show. This one. Have you been taking any other medication or drugs that you haven't told me about? <laughs> I don't believe you. You deliberately deceived me over a urine test. What are you trying to hide? Yeah, that's the good stuff. One of the first college classes I took dealt with microbiology and diseases caused by microorganisms and the like, and while it was a lot grosser than anything this game has, I found it quite fascinating. Okay, yeah, I'm really biased. I even looked up a lot of the terms here. Like, what the hell is Pleural Effusion? And Pivka 2? And S3 and S4? Oh, and especially this. What the fuck is back pain? Is that something people get? I, I, I had no idea. There's something else with these parts, though, that's more likely to win you over, especially if you're not into the nitty-gritty. And that would be the excellent writing and patient interactions. Some of these people are just real characters, especially the robot. I mean, one of the candidates they list for this 14-year-old chick is alcoholism. That's good, I like that one. I'm gonna write that down. This particular aspect is highly reinforced by the fact that the diagnostician we play as is easily the best character in the game. Dr. Gabriel Cunningham. Holy shit, this dude is a boss. He may seem to be an incredibly cynical, self-righteous dipwad upon first glance, which he definitely is, but I never found it to reach the point of annoyance. Not like he doesn't have the smarts to back up all his sarcastic remarks, though, given his position. Despite his attitude, though, he clearly cares about his patients and co-workers. He might be a cold, angry prick on the outside, but at the end of the day, he's just one big softy. He also has the most connections and experience out of any of the other characters, and constantly shows up in their own stories. He's even the only person acquainted with our last Doctor. I'm tempted to say he's also the most active character in the story, but he doesn't moonlight as a superhero in his spare time, so I'm gonna stop myself short. I will say his emotional struggles are a bit more down-to-earth than Captain Eagle's. Would you believe that a character with this kind of personality is going through a strung-out divorce and is also losing his son in the process? I wouldn't either, but that's one of the driving forces for this narrative, and I'll proceed to demonstrate how by dropping it for a bit and discussing the talking robot. Gabe's designated partner is the aforementioned Roni, a highly advanced computer given to him, begrudgingly, in order to assist with his diagnosing business. What follows is a typical sarcastic human and dry robot comedy of errors and follies, but the back and forth between them is consistently funny, so I can't really complain. Because MRI exams can yield more detailed images, they are generally used for foci in the head. You're just a walking encyclopedia of things I already know, huh? Speaking of back and forth, we also have the patients to deal with, and, uh, things get a little more complicated there. 
Gabe's story is more or less another narrative display of how this character wants to save lives. And these lives in particular aren't unconscious or on the operating table. At least not yet. They are fully aware and just wanting to know what the hell is wrong with them. For as easy as it sounds to answer that question, when certain patients have some nasty shit going on inside them, even for a veteran like Gabe, it ain't that simple to put into words how much trouble they're in. It's an interesting dilemma that probably isn't uncommon in other media with this premise, but I like how serious the dude gets when the situation's dire. He's such a great showcase of versatility and humanity that's not laughably framed like it was with Hank, or relying a little too much on cliché like it was with Tomoe. This conflict reaches its peak when he's forced to diagnose his son. A son who I presume has been so affected by the turmoil of his parents' crumbling marriage that he doesn't even recognize his own father. What's worse is that the illness he gets diagnosed with is a good old-fashioned case of, oh no. So after finishing up the analysis, Gabe just can't face him and decides to leave the rest to his co-workers, even as his son starts going into shock. One rage moment later, Roni manages to bring him back to his senses, and he makes the decision to save his son's life. Cause goddammit, even if he can't do anything, he's gonna try something. Firstly, I'd be more worried about how much he's gonna have to pay for, uh, Roni there. And, um, yeah, that, that's it for Gabe. For as much as I adore this guy, his own story is kinda scant. This may be due to how he has the least amount of stages out of any character, so perhaps they didn't have a whole lot of room for him to grow and didn't want to bring in any more severe melodrama. Then again, he has far more dialogue than other characters, so I, I guess it balances out well enough. What also helps is Travis Willingham giving one of the best performances of his career here. Every line is delivered so perfectly that I can't imagine any other person voicing him. So many little embellishments that just add so much to the character, too. It's so good. You're shy about your gut, huh? Too many steak dinners? Don't be ashamed. I'm not someone to judge a patient, no matter how fat they are. You, you son of a bitch! You can't talk to me like that. Ooh, you're getting angry, huh? Great, now stay just like that. Shout out to the Japanese voiceover too, Kiji Fujiwara. Never gotten a chance to hear that audio track as it could only fit the English dialogue in the game, but this man was a veteran who passed on recently, so I've no doubt it was good. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention that Gabe is pretty much Spike? That's my headcanon for what happened to him after Bebop, and I won't accept any other theories. Go fuck yourselves. Last but not least, we have the forensics portions. And they have a somewhat similar style to diagnostics, in that they also play out in a point-and-click adventure format. Let's not mince words here, though. These are murder mysteries. Forget any notions you have about forensic science, as if you had some already. We're not learning about how to best preserve corpses, or preparing them for organ transplant or whatever, and we're certainly not listening to Peter Thomas. No, someone got murdered, and we gotta figure out the hows, the whos, and the whys. You can thank Atlas USA once again for pushing towards this format, and for some reason you think it's a bit weird for a medical examiner to play detective, remember this simple fact. Anyone can be a detective. It can be an old lady, it can be a priest, it can be a lawyer, it can be a private Belgian sleuth. Anybody. So long as they have access to the resources necessary to solve cases and connections to actual detectives. In this case, the friggin' FBI. God bless America. That said, these segments pretty much play out like any other detective game normally would. We have our victim, we have our crime scenes, we have our witness testimonies, and we have a whole bunch of evidence to collect. Later on, we do get access to actual forensic tools like an ALS slide, luminal, and aluminum powder, which are used, respectively, to locate hard-to-find objects, hidden bloodstains, and fingerprints. Again, I point to Phoenix Wright, especially that one bonus case added to the DS release. I would be petty and say that they completely ripped that one off, but the mechanics in using those tools is actually quite different. Oh, so yeah, CSI and mainstream crime shows do this stuff all the time too. But whatever, here's where Trauma Team's approach to that differs. For one, you're not just gathering up evidence and using it to get more info out of people or to expose those fucking liars. Evidence is presented as these nifty cards, and while you're in your little computer room, you can send any suspicious ones to your FBI buddy for further analysis. Nice me icon, by the way, here's mine. Or combine them with other cards to learn something new. Once the combinations have reached their endpoint, they'll be turned into solid evidence and used for the last part of the case. Now, the practice of combining two items to make one is hardly something new for the adventure game format, and I've also been informed that this was a mechanic from past Shin Megami Tensei games, but I've never seen this style of gameplay used for a murder mystery before, and have it since, which is weird because I love the idea, and the way it's implemented in here works very well. 
It creates so many nice little aha moments. There is the issue of how stingy the game can get regarding which two cards can be combined, and with how relatively loose the order of combining these cards is, it can easily create a few incongruities with the dialogue, but I still think this is a cool gameplay mechanic and I would love to see it return in some game, someday. I, yeah, whatever. Secondly, there are many points where these segments will throw out a series of challenges to make sure that you're paying attention. They mostly come in the form of multiple choice questions, but sometimes it's a matter of choosing the correct spot in an image, or inputting a number via a keypad. This is where the mistake limit comes back in, as if you get any of these wrong, your limit gets chipped off, and 10 of these mistakes net you a suicide note. At least I think that's what these are. These I'm a bit less enthused about. They're a good way of keeping you engaged and informed with the mystery, and they're not really that difficult. But that's kind of the issue as well. It's often clear what the bogus answers are, and some of the questions are just strangely worded. Lastly, there is the occasional mini-game that has you put together the series of events that occurred with this case using your solid evidence cards. It's about as good a way as any to sum up each case without containing any fluff. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot this. Before all this begins, you get to hear the victim's last words prior to their trip to Deadtown. This doesn't really affect the gameplay, it's just a weird recurring element, but there is the issue of how at this point they make you act like the Wii is a phone, and the dialogue comes out of the Wii speaker. So this is the result. This also happens in Diagnostics and in several other Wii games than was necessary. Jesus Christ. So that's about all you can do while solving these murder mysteries, but what about the mysteries themselves? Surely with everything the game has packed in so far, they couldn't have put too much focus and effort here. And yet, the developers did not skimp out on telling a compelling story. I won't spoil what goes on in them, if I did we would be here for weeks, but they are some of the most engrossing mysteries I've seen in a game to date. There are only a few of them to solve, but they're surprisingly varied and complex and go in all sorts of directions in such an intriguing manner that even having gone through them tens of times at this point, and having the mystery spoiled, it still manages to grip onto me tightly. The emotional range is also all over the place. Some of these cases are just downright disturbing, and some of them are kind of stupid, but still fun enough. It also helps that, like with Diagnosis, these sections are written superbly well. And the conversations our final main character and the FBI contact have are just as interesting to listen to. Uh, Dr. Kimishima, have you confirmed that it's a murder after all? I don't know how you heard about that so quickly, little guy. Have you been eavesdropping on me? Uh, uh, no, I... <laughs> Forget it. I can see right through you. <laughs> Speaking of whom, let's get to our mystery lady of the hour, shall we? The ongoing narrative here sees the only returning character from any past Trauma Center game, Naomi Kimishima, who was the extra doctor you could play as in Second Opinion. As it turns out, she's changed quite a bit since dealing with guilt, perhaps not on the surface, she's just as cold, harsh, and intelligent as she was before, but that attitude has only been further emphasized now that she's a dead woman walking. She's been diagnosed with an unspecified yet incurable illness, and doesn't have much longer to live, hence why she's dropped her surgery career where she dedicated herself to saving lives, in favor of a profession where she examines those whose lives weren't or couldn't be saved. I suppose everyone has different ways of dealing with a terminal illness, but going down this route somehow gave her the gift to hear the last words of the victim she's taxed to examine through a cell phone, which earns her the nickname of The Corpse Whisperer. Ooh, s spooky. Yeah. Helping her out is the aforementioned FBI agent, a person she calls Little Guy. Except we all know who he really is and what he did. Anyway, the point is, Naomi's pretty much doomed to do this for the rest of her life and continue hypothesizing about what death is really like before she ends up on the same table as these corpses. Until she meets a little girl named Alyssa. This young lass happens to live right next to where Naomi works, and she's usually seen with her pet cat, Chloe. Naomi initially acts around her in the same manner she normally does towards anyone, but she eventually becomes acclimated to her cheerful and warm presence, which allows the emotional barrier she's built up for herself for so long to start slowly fading away. She even manages to help out with the case at one point. Completely by mistake, but still. Her job is more important at the moment though, and things start shifting even further when she takes on a serial killer who's been sending bombs to high-profile citizens around the area. The further she gets into the case though, the more it ups her profile. But she's determined to get this bomber behind bars no matter what consequences come her way. 
On a completely unrelated note, she receives a package outside her office partway through the investigation, apparently sent by Gabriel Cunningham. I told you he knew her, but uh, this seems a little fishy. I don't think you should open it. Oh, but, okay, let's just go ahead. Oh, wait, it's just a teddy bear. Uh, that can't be too bad. Don't tell me. Hey, who stole it? Alyssa, Alyssa, you get back here, you fucking bitch! Alyssa! Alyssa! Surprise! This incident sparks a brand new fire in Naomi, initially one of despair, but then one of hope and clarity, as she works even harder to bring the bomber to justice. Thankfully, Alyssa is saved by a certain expert surgeon, but sadly she wasn't the only victim in that bombing, as her family and home perished in the explosion. Oh, don't worry about the cat though, she was all somewhere licking her ass or something. Seeing the precarious situation Alyssa has been placed in, and despite her own condition threatened to cut off her life at any moment, Naomi makes the brave decision to adopt her. And now they can both live a happy life, even if it's only just for a little while longer. Once again, the stages themselves kind of overshadow the overarching story, and frankly, they are a lot more interesting than Naomi's own tale of sorrow. Don't get me wrong, she's a perfectly fine character in her own right, and the whole emotionless individual learns to open up arc is an inherently sweet one. The person doing her voiceover, Kirsten Potter, also does an excellent job bringing out the range of emotions Naomi goes through. So yeah, I don't have a problem with her, I do have a problem with Alyssa. The shit she goes through is a very tough pill to swallow, not just in general, but in terms of believability. Without spoiling anything regarding the mystery, she gets blown up in a similar manner to the way those high-profile citizens targeted by that serial bomber did, and we were just examining their corpses half an hour ago. She also goes into cardiac arrest during her major surgery for longer than any normal human would have lived past. I understand the writers probably didn't want to go too far with her, considering how important she is to Naomi's development at all, but it requires a lot more suspension of disbelief than other portions of the game. Gave her the gift to hear the last words of the victim she's taxed to examine through a cell phone, which ends with the nickname of The Corpse Whisperer. But yeah, other than that, it's pretty good. Now, Naomi's cool in my book. I'd let her examine my dead body if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, that sounded funnier in my head. And there we have it. Six gameplay modes, six characters, way too long an examination of all of them. Any one of these gameplay styles by themselves could fit an entire game if they expanded upon them. Having all of them implemented instead creates a boatload of content and variety that not a whole lot of games in this kind of format have seen, and I can still find at least some enjoyment with all of them, even if they're not all fantastic. When it comes to the story though, like we pointed out, the individual narratives each character goes through are mostly interesting by themselves, but some are certainly better than others, some are certainly busier than others, and some certainly make more sense than others. I would not be surprised if any of y'all looked at some of these plot points and went, well that's stupid. Because yeah, a lot of it is. And again, this is the one that's supposed to be the most grounded out of all the games in the series. And yet, I still love this narrative. For me it comes down to two things. The sheer sincerity of the writing that makes even the goofiest and dumbest things to happen in the game highly entertaining to watch. The way each narrative crosses over into each other. For example, some of the patients you work with in diagnosis may end up on the operating table. And some of the injured folk you help with in first response also end up on the operating table. Okay, yeah, that's the end point for a lot of these people. But any of the six characters can also subtly influence the direction of each other's story. And as such, dialogue from one character that seems like innate wisdom that they're parting onto the other may actually be influenced by whatever's affecting them in their own story. And while I have given away a fair amount of stuff, there are still a lot of surprises waiting to be discovered through this wonderfully seamless method of storytelling. And even I don't think I've found all of them. I think this is an excellently crafted narrative that already single-handedly beats out every other narrative in the Trauma Center series. And you know what the best part of it all is? We're not even close to the end yet! But before we delve into the final parts of the game, we gotta talk about some of its other aspects. One thing I want to point out, and oh, this is gonna sound a little bit weird because it's something I take for granted with most games, yet for some reason it's stuck out here, is how this has one of my favorite examples of positive reinforcement in any game I've played. 
On a stage-by-stage -stage basis, there are so many unique phrases that your operating assistant will use to praise you throughout the procedure, whether they be interjections, compliments, reassurances, or those post-operative quotes that change depending on which ranking you get. Sure, it's something that one could easily not pay any mind to, and it wouldn't affect anything, but it's such a great design choice. I love how genuine and grateful these phrases sound, and it warms my cold, dead heart every time I get thanked for saving a particular patient, no matter how hard I screwed the pooch. Now for the more general aspects we haven't touched on yet, mainly the aesthetics. I've already mentioned the changes to how most operations look. They're more stylized, more colorful, more flashy. And this style carries over to how the characters themselves look. And more often than not, they're just as bold. Kind of reminds me of the first game's art style. It's just so nice and clean. On occasion, however, whenever characters are shown from a distance, or lesser important characters are on screen, usually crowds, they lose most of their details in favor of this simpler, more hollow look. And I just never cared for it. I understand it was to save time making assets, but look at it. This looks like something that Junji Ito would draw. The cutscenes these characters are featured in do turn out to be a little bit better, but they also have some notable issues. As you've undoubtedly noticed, these sequences are like a weird mixture of manga and motion comics, where the characters are essentially paper cutouts moving around and changing positions. To the untrained eye, this is just a cheap way to avoid making actual animated cutscenes, and sadly no, they don't do that for the intro or credits either. But it's still a hell of a step up from the slideshow presentation of past games, and continues to contribute to the game's unique visual style. As for the actual quality of these cutscenes, though, well, well it's, it usually looks alright, whenever things are sitting still. Simple movements or transitions look fine, too, but whenever the animators try to do something dynamic... Uh... Yeah. It's unfortunate because this is how some of the more pivotal moments in the story are treated, and instead of invoking terror or suspense, they just look fucking goofy. Doesn't happen too often, but it's definitely noticeable when it does. Thankfully, the other side of those dang-ass aesthetics, aka the audio, fares a lot better. As I've explained like 50 times now, the voice acting is consistently good throughout the game. And there are a ton of other people in the cast I haven't even mentioned who all do a great job in addition to the main characters. Yuri Lowenthal, Keith Silverstein, Aaron Fitzgerald, Laura Bailey, any other person who's been in 10,000 other games here. Even Troy Baker shows up again to make up for just how boring he was as the new blood guy. I mean, he was okay, but come on. The soundtrack is also a major highlight. Comparing it to the other ones, I'm not sure it's as good as Under the Knife 2, and there isn't a groove in here as tight as Second Opinion's Hope Hospital theme. God, I love this song. But Trauma Team has a highly memorable and exciting score. I am more than happy to illegally download it to my phone for long car trips. If there was one sticking point with the overall sound design, it'd be that the sound mixing is kinda off in places. Like music and sound effects can drown out dialogue far too easily if there's enough going on. It's a good thing this is more prominent in operations than during important story moments, but as a sound person, this shit still irks me to no end. Zero out of ten. Uh, yep, I think that's all. Let's move on to the crazy shit. A quick forward before we start here. If you've gotten this far, first off, congratulations, you've likely realized how much time I've wasted on this junk. And if for some reason you don't want to be spoiled any further, go to this timestamp for a little aftermath and wrap up. Between here and there, though, is no man's land, and we are not going back. Take heed. This is your last warning. Alright, let's go. So while we've detailed each character's personal story ad nauseum, you may be wondering to yourself, what exactly is the overarching narrative that ties them all together? The previous Trauma Center games have <clears throat> centered around some sort of mass outbreak of terrible disease, whether it be guilt or stigma or a post-guilt. It's a stupid name. But we didn't see anything like that during the main game. Or did we? On occasion, you'd see a person, or even a corpse, exhibiting a particular black bruise. And more often than not, those people would also exhibit some bizarre, often unexplainable patterns of weird behavior or sicknesses. The latter of which would get progressively worse and worse as time passed. 
This was most apparent in the diagnosis and forensic segments, but would occasionally show up in surgery, orthopedics, even first response. There was also a name that some of these people would scribble down somewhere or blurt out amidst their attacks. That name being Rosalia. Very suspicious, wouldn't you say? But I'm just joshing all of you. There's no way this has any sort of significance whatsoever. There's just no way. Is there? Rosalia. You ever play a T-rated game that, had it just pushed itself a bit further, would have easily received an M rating? Uncharted comes to mind. Anyway, this is the point where every character's story collapses onto each other, and they slowly come together as a team in order to fight whatever the fuck caused that. And gameplay-wise, that means getting hit with another series of stages that feature a somewhat balanced showing of all six professions. We'll be going through each one, as well as the story bits in between, to piece together the puzzle that this game has been teasing towards this whole time. And like I said, things are gonna get messy, so hold on tight. Following a brief inquiry about Maria's sanity, having revealed to her crew that she's been seeing dead people, and Naomi appearing out of nowhere to back her up, the team get notified about Ms. Bleedout. So they take off to the transit center and find themselves in one hell of a crisis. Not only do they have to deal with the lady, but a bunch of other people who have started experiencing similar complications, or just went nuts and got themselves horrifically injured, or both. So yes, the first stage we have is another first response segment, and this one's notable in that these folks can't be transported out at all. So it's a matter of fixing them up and maintaining their vitals until outside help arrives. It's a pretty daunting task, even if there's only a few of them, but thankfully it's hardly impossible, and it's just as exciting as any other stage. Unfortunately, helping out these specific people isn't nearly enough to stop whatever the hell is spreading from spreading. And in other great news, this sickness isn't relegated just to the transit center, and it's now reached several other areas. Shit's gone south so fast that a state of emergency has to be declared by the CDC. Hmm... Interesting. Elsewhere, our lovable diagnostician, who at the end of his story left for Sergum, gets hired by the army to examine one of their researchers, who started displaying some odd symptoms after working on a skeleton they brought in the week prior. From the outset, this dude don't look so great, and by examining him further, Gabe finds out that he ain't doing so great on the inside too. I mean, I don't think housing a few malignant tumors is that good of a prognosis, but eh, I could be wrong, I'm not a doctor. Or am I? Oh, and those weird bruises showed up again. Yep, he's in trouble. Well, hopefully the army will allow him to get right up on the operating table so he can be cured of his sickness, right? Yeah, and maybe dad will come back with the sickies he went out to get 10 years ago. For as much as they want to get a diagnosis on this dude, the army's not too keen on letting this thing get out to the public. So they prevent Gabe from doing any more of his job and will now allow one of their own to die for the sake of their country. The more things change, something, something, something. Fortunately, Verney is able to find a way to get more symptoms out of the army man without getting the army's attention. And this is what makes this diagnosis segment probably the best one of the game. It's not really too different from how it normally plays out, but I love the casual manner of the writing and how much sugarcoating we have to put on the conversation with our supremely fucked patient. It's both quite hilarious and not the least bit intimidating. That doesn't last forever though, and Army Man's condition reaches critical mass, forcing Gabe to scramble together the last bit of symptoms before the army can stop him. From this, we discover that this critical mass is actually a viral hemorrhagic fever, which, to put it nicely, causes the host to bleed out from every possible orifice. 
among other complications. But what virus could be causing the hemorrhagic fever, and what's up with the endless tumor formation? Hmm... Man, I... I just don't know. Anyway, with the diagnosis complete, Gabe is apprehended by the army and is shot on sight. No, no, seriously, that's how the game ends. Or at least, that's how the man wants you to think this is how it ends. I hacked the FBI recently and found out what actually happened. Yep, it was that easy. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> Roni and some fat bastard politician we helped out earlier opens up an escape route for our bumbling hero. And he manages to flee the premises off into the sunset, unscathed. God bless America. <laughs> Don't worry, that didn't actually happen. Also, that was the last diagnosis segment of the game, which is very sad for a young boy like myself, and a relief for pretty much everyone else. It's a shame, though. Sometimes you wish you could have done things differently. Maybe that girl was an alcoholic after all. Over in solitary confinement, Jim is about to be transferred to another area of... solitary confinement, as the disease in the outside world is spreading fast. So fast it reached the officer who was just about to transfer him. Looks like his pay is gonna get docked, the fucking moron. Even with the risk of getting labeled as a fugitive, Jim makes his escape afterwards and gets labeled as a fugitive. After wandering the desolate city for a bit, he finds himself in a medical center that's just packed to the brim with the ill and likely dead. I think I wrote something down in my notes at this part, uh, let's see... Ah, yes, that's about right. This situation is so fucked, a guy collapses right in front of him, and that's when his doctoral instincts kick in. Even with Holden somehow managing to track him down, and pointing a gun in his face, Jim vows to save this man and never fall victim to cowardry again. You're a fugitive. I can't authorize that operation. Then shoot me. I'm not abandoning this person to die. This is what you taught me to be. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll stop with that. So we have another surgery to do, with Maria tagging along. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention she's here too. And it's a rather simple operation compared to some of the other ones we did pre-Crisis. Kinda reminds me of some of the ones from past games, where you have to keep some material from entering the bloodstream, or going in a certain direction, or something like that. Oh, and there's also the claw. Ugh, stop doing that, it's not sanitary. It's not bad, but it's hardly important in comparison to the essential story elements fed to us upon completion of the operation. The constant presence of these black bruises is enough to clear Jim's head and trigger some horrible memories, which he regales to Maria as they make their escape from the FBI. Jeez, everyone's getting hunted down. As a young and spry lad, Jim's parents were terrified of him because... reasons. I mean, I guess he was obsessed with some stuff in this book and he was very emotionless about it, so yeah, I'd say that's grounds for despising your own flesh and blood. And it wouldn't be the first time this game showed parents as complete cowards. One day, though, Jim's mama and papa mysteriously perished, leading to his subsequent adoption by a professor named Albert Sartre. He raised Jim as his own and even allowed him to assist with his research, which involved finding, testing, and curating a virus to kill all other viruses. Unfortunately, Sartre was working with a virus that killed not only other viruses, but everything. And one day, he accidentally caused an outbreak of said virus at his workplace, an institution known as Cumberland College. Yeah, we already knew Jim here didn't cause the incident that got him two and a half centuries in prison, we just didn't know who it actually was. And now we do. Oh, but we ain't done with the twist yet. Albert fled the facility after the outbreak occurred and hadn't been found since. The only other piece of information Jim could recall was how he isn't the only person Albert had adopted. He had also taken in a young girl by the name of Rosalia Rossellini. And guess whose blood was used to cultivate this super virus? Oh, and guess who's the apparition that Maria keeps seeing? And the girl she had saved when her dumbass started that fire at her old orphanage. Bish. Bash. Boosh. While this dynamic duo follow their newfound lead, we cut back to the people at Resurgum, who are just having a lovely time dealing with this viral outbreak. Halt this flatlining! This isn't good! Starting resuscitation! Get the AED ready! No pulse yet! Damn it! Once more! Like I said, lovely. We get to play as Hank again, with Naomi supporting him for the operation, and he's tasked to treat a 10-year-old girl who not only has the virus, but several fractures and 
bone tumors. Bone tumors. This would be totally harrowing if it weren't for how we're doing orthopedics again, and if it weren't for how this is easily the worst stage in the entire game. Here's how you deal with a bone tumor. You chisel out the infected bone from eight different sides by smacking the Wiimote until your wrist snaps, make a synthetic bone to fill in the gap, place it in said gap, and finally screw it in with the screws. It's a long and tiring process to get rid of just one, and you have to do it four times. In between them, you get to deal with the fractures, which includes a completely shattered femur. Again, 10-year-old here. It's not unbearable, but it just lacks any tension due to how easy the whole affair is and just how these orthopedic stages are structured in the first place. The only other noteworthy aspect of the operation is everything going on around it. The sheer terror of the people who are just trying to deal with this crisis as best as they can. Drain! The hemorrhaging won't stop! I need another transfusion! We can't suit it fast enough! Ah, incoming cardiac arrest! It's, yeah, it's pretty unsettling. There's a lot of real weight to it and it gives off a great sense of how truly screwed everyone is. I just wish the gameplay did a better job of reinforcing that. With that shit out of the way, we get to see Tomoe visiting Alyssa post Boom Boom, and she seems to be taking things pretty well, even if she doesn't look that well herself. But as per usual, she's more worried about her cat, Chloe, who seems to have gotten quite sick again. Despite the ongoing deadly crisis and the growing body count, Tomoe decides to take a deep look inside the cat, and Naomi backs her up once again. I mean, yeah, I guess she is Alyssa's mother now, so she must be contractually bound to make her daughter happy. She'll do anything for the little brat. So we have another endoscopy operation that, at first, doesn't look too different from the other ones, besides how we're not in a human this time. With that, though, the internal passages end up being far narrower, and the max vitals are also much smaller. Still doesn't explain why we're taking a break from the end of the fucking world, but sure enough, the reason we're actually doing this in the first place makes itself very apparent. As it turns out, the cat had swallowed some kind of foreign object. But not just any foreign object, pieces of bone. And not just any bone, human bone. Very strange indeed, and what's stranger is what's underneath the bone. A very intimidating foci that any sane person in the world would not want to handle without extreme caution. I'm going to retrieve the focus so we can send it in for a biopsy. What? The, the focus burst. What the fuck is wrong with you people? All ribbing aside, I actually like this stage more than most of the other endoscopy ones, due to the different factors in play and how it finds a way to up the ante effectively in spite of its clunky controls. I say that, but this is probably just residual praise having gone through that last orthopedic stage. Maybe I'm just thankful for some actual urgency here. I don't know, you decide. After finishing up with a little pussy, Tomoe goes off and does something else, while Naomi steps outside for a quick second, and... Huh? What an entrance. Gabe bears gifts for his return to Resurgum, and thankfully it's not a bomb this time. It's the Skellyban remains that the army had discovered, which he had borrowed from them after making his escape. He tasks Naomi with reconstructing the skeleton and using that, as well as the personal effects that came along with it, to identify who this Skeleton used to be, and maybe figure out what killed it too. It's already significant enough to the story since the fucking army had it in its possession, and the dude who was researching it got infected with the same thing everyone else is getting infected with. Thus, we begin another forensic segment. Hooray! Is what I would like to say. And while I still do like this one, it's easily the least interesting forensic case. Which is funny, because this is the only one that actually feels like something a forensic scientist would do rather than going around solving murders. I guess Atlas USA was onto something. Anyway, in figuring out the identity of this corpse, we do get some important info. Cause in a shocking twist, these are the remains of the one and only Albert Sartre. And in another twist, he was carrying and succumbed to the deadly virus. So, of course, that would mean, even in Skellyman form, the virus remains within these remains. But this is just a skeleton. A virus requires living cells from its host in order to multiply. So, this virus not only survives the host's death, but can continue within a skeletonized corpse. Can you really say that such a thing is impossible? Uh, but... That's not like you. Calm down, little guy. 
Everything we've seen up until now has taught us something, that there are diseases out there in the world that defy all our understanding and what we think of as common sense. Yeah, if you have it by now, you might want to start suspending your disbelief to... Um... 80%? Yeah, 80%, that's about right. We also learn that said virus is transferred through mucous membrane contact rather than the air, which explains why Chloe had the foci earlier, because those bones were actually a part of the skelly man, and explains why the army researcher man got infected too, because he had shaved a portion of the bone for a sample and inhaled the particles. But it doesn't explain why the hell practically everyone in the area, and other areas too I presume, got infected. Hmm, what could it be indeed? Cutting back to Jim and Maria once again, we see the pair scavenging through Maria's former home to find any clues that could lead them to Rosalia. They don't find much except for a letter that was sent to Maria over five years ago, which contains no useful information. There's this cute little photo in there though, isn't that nice? Well actually, even though it does seem to be nothing more than just an innocent photo, Jim is able to use this to deduce her possible location thanks to the blooming flowers in the background and the monarch butterflies spread across- It's Mexico, okay? It's Mexico. With their newestly, they get ready to set off the border, but as it turns out, there's still a pandemic going on and some ungrateful shitheads went and got themselves infected, leading the army to push their backload onto Resurgum. Tut tut, general population, you disappoint me once again. So we've made it to the last first response stage, and it's fittingly the most chaotic one. The good news is we can alleviate some of the infected of their symptoms with simple antiviral medication, but the bad news is we have to keep reapplying it to them lest they continuously lose their vitals before they get shipped out. And a good chunk of them have secondary injuries we still have to deal with too. As a culmination of all the methods and practices experienced through this gameplay style, it works perfectly. Oh, and I also lost a victim for like the first time ever. I know I implied earlier that I have in the past, but no, this was actually the first time that ever happened. Sorry, Martha, I, I, I just couldn't help you. With yet another crisis averted, we make the wise decision to ignore the suffering and gather all the main characters for one big exposition dump. It's not really anything we haven't learned yet, just a more concrete explanation of what destructive virus we're facing this time around. But they do decide to give it an actual name. The Rosalia virus. Dun dun dun. May as well give some general thoughts on this big bad virus. I would say compared to the past big bad viruses in the series, I like how it's derived from actual viruses that exist in the real world, so to me, at least, it's a lot more threatening. Though when you boil it down, it's more or less guilt without the parasitic aspects. It devours anything in its host's body and will kill it within days. And if the crew aren't fast enough to find a cure, all of America will die within a week. Sheesh, yeah, you don't want to be spreading this around the country, do you, America? The only possible solution is an anti-serum, and the only way that anti-serum can be acquired is if they locate the originator of it all, Rosalia. Luckily, the FBI make a heel turn and assist the crew in this search by loaning one of their helicopters to them. Maria and Naomi go with Agent Holden to do that, and the rest stay behind to keep fighting the chaos. Like a bunch of badass doctors in this situation would. Yeah. Alright, we went this long without mentioning the obvious. Yes, at the time of writing, recording, the upload date, and however long it's taken since then, assuming it does, the real world is still experiencing a viral pandemic of its own. But allow me to make one thing clear. I didn't make a video about Trauma Team merely because of this ongoing pandemic, in spite of the numerous parallels between it and the game's events. I haven't even mentioned the biggest one, the year Trauma Team is set in. Go ahead, guess what year it is. No, really, guess. 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 Ah! To be fair, I did play and record footage during the early stages of quarantine, but that was more so because one of my favorite games of all time was turning 10 this year, and I didn't have anything better to do since we were in quarantine, so may as well make a video about it. Hell, I wanted to finish this thing by the game's 10th anniversary. But severe apprehension and general laziness got the better of me, so nothing too different from the norm. All that said, the writers did draw inspiration from real-life events during the crafting stage of this plot. The main source of inspiration was ongoing at the time of the game's development, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. Granted, while my memory from that time is a little hazy, I'm pretty sure it didn't have nearly the same level of impact our current one does, or even the one in the game. But of course, it's obvious what the game actually predicted if you look at it close enough. Yes, the Ebola pandemic from half a decade ago, as Ebola is one of several actual deadly viral hemorrhagic fevers out there. 
I'm on to you, Tepai Kobayashi. I've been going over this data for years now, and I've finally come to this conclusion. The Phantom Thieves will catch up to you and end your rampage. <clears throat> okay, let's get back to the current proceedings, shall we? We don't get to have fun down south just yet, though, as Hank still has one more operation up his sleeve, and it's a combination of past procedures all bundled into one reasonably paced and reasonably exciting package, i.e., it's fine. What, did you think I had anything else to say? I spent all my rage points on the bone tumor operation. I got nothing left. Let's move on. Ten years old. The helicopter trio have over 760,000 square miles to look for that virus-hosting woman girl after crossing the border, and unsurprisingly, they have no clue where to start. While throwing out ideas, Maria remembers the monarch butterflies from Rosalia's photo, and as if on cue, the sun rises and puts a glorious shine on a kaleidoscope of the things. I think that's the right term, at least. Don't at me if I'm wrong. The trail leads to a patch of lovely looking flowers in the middle of nowhere, and within the inconspicuous patch of blue ones is... Over there. Someone's over there. So, that's her. Yeah. Ugh, great. So with one dead rose, and I guess all the time in the world, everyone's favorite medical examiner decides to take a crack at one more case. This is by far the gnarliest forensic case in the entire game, and that's saying something. But that's also what makes it the best. That and the discoveries Naomi finds through the evidence at hand and through restored audio logs. It's one big old puzzle that turns into, well, let's just say it ain't exactly a pretty picture. As it turns out, Albert Sartre had fled the US and continued his research into the Rosalia virus at this very location with his beloved host, I mean daughter. Sadly, the man had already been infected by the virus at this point, and its hallucinogenic effects, combined with how deadlocked he was in his research to get it to not fucking kill everything, makes him snap resulting in the murder of his own daughter in a vain attempt to try to prevent the virus from spreading. And man, do some of those logs just hit home the sheer sorrow of the whole affair. But as sad as it all is, we have yet to hit the real juicy bits. Albert passed on two years before the game's current date, and as most corpses in the middle of nowhere usually go, he was recruited into the skeleton army. From the information we just learned about, though, Rosalia died well before that. So why wasn't she also recruited to the Skelly Army? Was she a draft dodger? She probably was if she had to be rescued by a spunky teenager in the living world. But yeah, remember how I mentioned that the virus still lived on in Albert's remains? It's also doing that for Rose. The fatal amount of blood she lost thanks to dear old daddy had seeped into the ground upon where she lay, which affected the patch of flowers surrounding our fair maiden. It's turned her body into an adipocere and preserved it in its current state. Very strange, right? But why is this important in the first place? Well, even after all this time, we still don't exactly know how the virus spread to all those areas up north. And the answer to that lies within the flowers. There was a vector. A vector? Yes, some method of transmission that carried the virus from these flowers. This is how the virus spread to cause the infections in cities hundreds of miles away from here. Huh? What? Can't you tell? It's... Oh boy, where do we even begin here? First of all, let's get the obvious reference out of the way. It was the butterfly, I tell you. The butterfly! <laughs> and secondly, just the fuck? This is one of the more confounding twists of the story I've had to grapple with for a while now. More than most, if not all of the other ones. Yes, in a game with superheroes, ghosts, children surviving close-range explosions, smart-ass robots, and a lady who can hear the last words of a victim through her fucking cell phone, this is the most baffling thing to happen here. Hell, probably the entire series. This is almost on the level of a fucking Professor Layton twist. And yet, 
in spite of how monstrously stupid this all sounds, I fucking love it. Maybe y'all don't find it as batshit as I do, and honestly, compared to other visual novel games, this is rather tame, but the sheer ballsiness of this twist and how this all jump-started the events of the game is so admirable to me. Oh man, this game is one hell of a trip. And I know I may seem down on a lot of the sillier moments going on in this game, just all the weird decisions these characters are making, especially in this part, but what, I'm having too much fun to care. The characters are just as befuddled at this revelation, but at least all the secrets have now been revealed and there's not really much more to find out. Except for how they're gonna fix it all. Alright, I'll be right. Oh, oh. oh, yeah, and that too. I actually no, don't worry about it, she's fine. All nuttiness aside, having turned into wax, Rose and her blood are now completely useless in the more important quest to get an anti-serum developed so that America doesn't spontaneously combust. So instead, the blue flowers surrounding her are up to bat. Good thing they're already in a facility that allows them to make these things quickly. Thank you, Albert Sart, you fucking bastard. Also, bonus points if you can guess how he was named. Back at Versurgum for like the millionth time now, shit's still fucked. Uh, wait, let me just check my notes again. Nope, yeah, that's about right. And liking their best paramedic and forensic person, I guess, our heroes are having trouble unfucking that shit. Hold on, I love this part. Understood. I'll immediately. <laughs> uh, sorry, I... uh, smooth move, Casanova. After that misstep, we get to play another endoscopy segment. This one essentially an expanded version of the one where we stuck the camera inside a fucking cat. Another series of foci and other complications, just dealing with them one after the other. Before finally, we get to a colony of the bastards. Luckily, we're not just gonna poke them until they go away. Once that's done did, it looks like we're all safe now. Nothing could possibly... Chain reaction. Colonies are exploding everywhere. No, we can still do this. <laughs> uh, we're all gonna die. Huh? This is Lucasite. Dropping in ten, nine, eight, seven. That's. Huh? Maria? You're... Chief, we brought the serum. Start distributing it. Oh, that was... fast. With Maria and Naomi back from their summer vacation, we get to do the second half of Tomoe's last endoscopy. And all that needs to be done is to excise any of the nasties, insert the serum, and repeat until it's completely eradicated. It's a little underwhelming. Maybe halting the first part for that split-second pang of terror kind of hindered it. But it's as good as a conclusion as any, I suppose. So with that operation completed and the anti-serum getting sent all over the country, the pandemic ends just as quickly as it began. Sheesh. This is a pretty entertaining story. It's got some really bonkers twists, but it's it's fun. It's fun. I, I really love the chemistry between these six characters, too. Just, just what more can you ask for besides that? I especially love seeing them all come together to celebrate the success of ending this complete nightmare. Oh, wait a minute, Where, where's the corpse whisperer? Oh wait, there she is. How can I ever save this poor princess? Oh, she's, that's just sweet. She's gonna be a great mother, I can just feel it. someone should have checked on her back in Mexico. In case you forgot this too, Naomi still has that life-threatening disease completely unrelated to Rosalia inside her, and thanks to Rosalia, it's come right back around to bite her in the ass. No idea how, or where, or when she was infected, my bet's on need to get handsy with the virus's origin, but it jump-started this life-threatening disease into killing mode. 
It's gonna take one hell of an operation in order to deal with this last remnant of the virus and save her. Which is why Jim is brought on for this final job, and Gabe even gets in touch with an old friend for assistance. To be honest, these materials can't tell me everything, but... Listen carefully, please. If the focus is as I predict... I told you this man knows everyone! God, he rules. Also, I love this shot. Some theorize this means that oh, he has the healing touch, but I, I disagree. We don't need that voodoo magic in our house. This game's already silly enough as is. So here we are with the final surgery stage. The last one in the series, come to think of it. And I will say this, it's definitely reminiscent of those ye old guilt stages. We ain't dealing with no tumor-infested bunghole this time. We got ourselves a goddamn bug on our hands. Look at these things, man. I'd argue they look worse than some of guilt diseases. The stage itself is relatively simple, despite having an immense amount of steps needed to be done in order to get rid of this thing. But that and the high-octane background music makes it very satisfying. And when we get straight to the heart of the matter, no pun intended, and that piano kicks in... Man... It's, it's, it's perfect. Also, what the fuck is this? Jesus Christ! Oh god, we're losing her! Inject the brown shit! <laughs> Be gone. And I love how even after just everything, you still have to close up the patient like it was just any regular surgery. Fucking attention to detail, man. You gotta love it. From here, we go into epilogue mode and learn most of the characters are uh, more or less in the same positions they've always been, but now have made significant changes in their lives or met some significant people to help them make those changes. This is especially the case with Naomi, because as it turns out, getting infected with Rosalia may have been the biggest stroke of luck for her. The virus appeared to have completely rid her of her previous terminal illness and the cells affected by it, so she's been completely cured and can now live a long life with her newfound daughter. Well, yeah, I guess it is the virus to destroy all viruses. You can call this saccharine and schmaltzy all you want, and it most certainly is, but the earnesty in how it's delivered just makes it work for me. It just puts the dumbest smile on my face. And now with everything wrapped up in a neat little bow, we get an excellent end credits theme, courtesy of Benjamin Franklin of all people. Ah, I, I guess he's still alive and just doing anime music now, who knew? Oh, yeah, and we get a post credit scenes with our lovable diagnostician, who up and shatters the fourth wall by telling us how much of a cool dude we are. The Seventh Doctor, huh? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, no, this doesn't look right. And that is finally it. That's the whole story. Ugh, it took long enough. There are some post-game odds and ends you can chase after like a higher difficulty that yields the highest rank possible, or these medals one can collect by performing certain tasks during stages. It's a cool idea, but the hints they give out as to what needs to be done to obtain these medals aren't exactly helpful, and all you really get out of it are some voice clips that also tell you what a cool dude you are. It's cute, but not essential. And as for the higher difficulty... Uh... No thanks. The best additions, IMO, were these audio logs that vaguely touch on the lives of our doctors after the grueling challenges they were faced with. There's also one featuring a not-dead Albert Sard and Rosalia that's... I, uh... did something horrible to your brother. I don't think he'll be able to forgive me. That's not true. Rose. I'm... I'm sure that he loves you, too. Rose. It'll be alright, Dad. I know it. Is that so? Thank you, my little Rose. <sighs> I'm just gonna go cry on my Wii U for a minute. I'll, I'll be right back. Ow. Overall, yeah, there are definitely a lot of flaws within the game. It's far from perfect. 
it definitely has a relatively niche appeal that not everyone is going to jive with. But there's just so much love and care put into this game that I believe shines through in spite of these issues. Kaduk Team had one last shot, and by God did they put their all into it. The mixture of its massive story, the positive reinforcement, the gameplay variety, and even the crazier elements somehow work together far better than it really should. Which is also why I'm not sure this can ever be repeated. There are certainly similar games with this sense of optimism in its themes, and ones with a similarly unstructured narrative that eventually forms into one with a solid path, but as an overall package, Trauma Team is kind of a lightning in a bottle, a culmination of ideas and reiterations in a series need of revitalization at the time. They could very well try to make Lightning Strike twice, but at this point, it's just never gonna happen. The game's release did see a good amount of praise from critics and audiences, but while sales weren't totally dire, they paled in comparison to some of Atlas's other titles at the time, and at the rate their profile was growing, an okay sales performance just wasn't gonna suffice. Might have done better if they didn't release it the same day as Red Dead Redemption, and Alan Wake, and Shrek Forever After. What the fucking hell, Atlas? You knew that was gonna be the biggest one of the day and you did nothing about it? As such, Kaduk Team broke apart to other projects, and since then, there hasn't been much of a peep regarding Trauma Center, especially after Atlas went through a merger and a Sega buyout over the next few years. There was one tiny little glimmer of hope, though. Completely out of nowhere, Atlas re-released Trauma Team for digital download on the Wii U's eShop during the summer of 2015, in Japan. Being the massive fan I am of that game, I went and emailed Atlas HQ themselves to make sure this wasn't a fluke, and more importantly, if this would come westward. Their response was more than a little coy, but sure enough, it reached the eShop later in December of that year. If anything, this confirmed that, well, they know the series still exists, and that there was enough demand for this re-release. So maybe there was a slim, slim possibility that the series could return and absolutely nothing happened since. Personally, I blame the failed live-action pilot. Yes, that did happen, and yes, it's not very good. He was dead when he got to County Ike. This is the system, this is our job. We knew what County was like and we came here anyway. I know how you feel. No, don't say that. You do not know how I feel. So, at the end of the day, for like the girliest time now, I love this game. I love it so much. Maybe all the nitpicking works against conveying that love, and maybe I'm too enamored with it. I, again, I can certainly see why others wouldn't care for it, or even go as far as to despise it. While I was writing the script, I found a GameFAQs walkthrough where the writer labeled the non-operational segments as... Filler. And different strokes, I guess. This was not the kind of game that was ever going to set the world on fire, but it's such an important one to me anyway. If you've somehow garnered any interest in it too, or the series in general, even if you've spoiled yourself on the experience by watching this whole thing, you can still find secondhand copies on the cheap side floating around the interwebs, and if you have a Wii U, you can still download it from there. Although, who knows how much longer that's gonna last. And who knows what the future holds for this series. It's more than likely dead, it's never gonna come back, but... The Switch is more than capable to recreate the core Trauma Center experience, and Atlas is starting to release former exclusives on PC, so anything is possible. And I think it's always good to have just a little bit of hope, even in the most pressing of times. Or you could just play another Surgery Sim game on the DS. I... 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 I, I don't... I didn't like it. Hey all, Bitch here. Thank you so much for watching this two hour long fiasco. <laughs> Why don't I just go in the movies? You fuck. But seriously, if you took the time to watch this whole thing, I really appreciate it. Like I said, this is my first attempt at a long form type video and there's probably more in the future that I'll be able to improve upon, hopefully, or at least not make as long as this one. With that in mind, I gotta recover from all of this, but before I do, I wanna give a shout out to the good boy Mr. Klemps, whose style has served as a huge inspiration for getting this video together, and I've admired his work for quite a while, I want to try to apply that to my own style with my own favorite games as well, so big thanks to that rat boy, and a huge thanks to my buddies and fellow content creators who supported me throughout this endeavor. 
directly or indirectly, I, I couldn't have trudged through this without y'all. All right, that about wraps it. I'm gonna go spam Atlas's inbox with demands for a new Trauma Center game. So, once again, thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see y'all later.